Hi there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Cloud Based Mayhem. My guest today is my dear friend Kiwi, or James or Rock, Kiwi pilot uh, from New Zealand, who has just recently, actually in the last couple of weeks, emigrated officially to the United States. But Kiwi is one of the most fascinating people in the world, certainly the most fascinating person I have ever met. And he's been to Burning Man, I think, every year since the late 90s and has written a couple of books on psychedelics and has been flying since the mid 80s and has come across in all that time with pretty much every big name in flying and paragliding and this is basically story time with James Arat with Kiwi. Uh, we had a blast. We are down in Texas chasing the world record. Been down here for almost two weeks now and the weather has not been totally cooperative a couple of pretty nice flights but so we're just camped out waiting for it being patient and uh kiwi came over today and we just had a nice fireside chat of course without the fire we don't need any fire down here in texas it's warm enough as it is but uh, having a blast and this was a fun talk about kind of the history of flying and all the crazy things that kiwi has seen along the way and we also talked just very briefly about his brand new book, his third book called Under the Influence, 20 Tales of Psychedelic Noir, which I just started yesterday and I'm loving. It's, it's hysterical and thoughtful and poetic and a lot of fun. So Kiwi's a great writer. You've all probably read a lot of his stuff in Cross Country Magazine over the years and others. So enjoy this talk with James Arock, aka Kiwi. Kiwi, dude, we've been trying to do this for a long time. We um, have, we have. I'm excited that we're down here chasing, chasing distance in Texas, and the weather's not co cooperating, so it's a perfect time to sit down with you and hear about the craziness. I've just been enjoying your third book. Uh, it's fantastic. It's hysterical, and uh, I think we're going to all be entertained by your stories of, of flying and the collision that you've had with flying over the years uh take us back to the very beginning how did you get into this madness yeah it's funny when you you know thinking back i think uh i was at university in new zealand and i was about 17 years old and my friends took me skiing for the first time to wanaka and i'm pretty sure that was the first time i saw somebody flying because guys were flying off the road there in 86 or 85 and then the, ne the next year i ended up moving to wanaka for the winter to pursue skiing uh, and that was when I first got, took my first paragliding mini flights uh, with some of the crew of younger guys out of Queenstown. Um, and I hadn't actually bought a glider at that point. And then in 87, I went to Jackson Hole, you know, once again, just purely by luck, really, because I didn't really know a lot about the place. Um, continuing my pursuit of skiing at that point, and uh, my roommate was Jim Olson, who was the first uh, person, probably the only person who's legally flown off the Grand Teton. Uh, and, I, and he'd done that about six months earlier in 1987. So it felt like uh, paragliding, which was a pretty obscure and small thing at that point, just kept popping up for me fairly regularly. And then uh, we had a guy, Kurt Kleiner in Jackson Hole, who was given lessons. So that was the first opportunity to really give it a go. And what were the gliders? Uh, I don't remember exactly what Kurt was. They were very simple seven, nine cell, square. You know, we were all climbers that just thought it was a great way to get down. Mm. That was the real attraction at that point. Because down climbing was definitely a danger all of its own. Mm. Um, we had a guy, uh, Rene, a Swiss guy in Queenstown, who made a glider called the Renegade. And it had little pins in the corners. You could pin it to a snowbank. Uh, Queenstown was quite a hub for paragliding in the late 80s because a lot of New Zealand mountain guides would go to France, Chamonix and what have you for the for the summers or opposite seasons and then they were coming back with all the gear and I mean our, my first manual was in French. It was definitely a very French aspect to the sport in those early days and um, that was when you know these what we now call extreme really started to sort of come into focus. But the French called glissé and I remember when I went to Jackson Hole, or heading to Jackson, I really thought I was on my way to Chamonix. 
Um, and Jean-Marc Bouvon, who had just flown with Everest in 88 on an elder car, he and Bruno Gervi and guys like that were a huge influence on a 20-year-old New Zealander with $1,000 and one-way ticket a pair of skis. <laughs> and Jackson ended up having a lot of influence on you. Well, I ended up staying in Jackson for 14 years or something like that. I like to say, I went, the first winter I arrived, I pretty much had everything dropped in my lap. Uh, and a typical 20-year-old Kiwi, I, you know, I burned all my bridges and then spent the next 14 years trying to rebuild them all is the way I like to put it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, I, feel, you know, I, real, I feel very fortunate that a lot of times, just through sheer luck, I've ended up really at the right place at the right time. And certainly my paragliding career, I've been an observer to a lot of really interesting things. Um, it always amazes me the way I keep, keep bumping back into it. But Jackson in the uh, early 90s was a really awesome place to, to be. A, you know, the paragliding was new and we didn't have much hand gliding up there. There wasn't really a hand gliding history. It was really a climber's place. Mm. So we were it was sort of the double-edged sword. We didn't know anything, but we were all figuring it out ourselves. And there was a great, a great early group of us that included uh, the guys that are all, a lot of them are still flying. Um, I think John Patterson was probably the pilot most responsible for sort of giving us a bunch of structure because uh, he was an engineer and obviously had been paying attention. You know, like I look back at some of my early mistakes and it took me years to figure out something as simple as wing sizing. I kept buying wings that were too small because I thought they were fast and silly things like this. And I remember. Uh, John Patterson had this Adele, uh, one of the early ones, and the thing would just seem massive. And I realized, you know, now why? Because it's sizing. And I'm a big guy, so I should have been on big gliders. But, uh, I, you know, John was responsible for my first thermal and the first cross country in, in Jackson Hole. We were, we were, it was me and him and another pilot were living together. And I was working in something manual. And I came home from the day and John had flown like five miles or eight kilometers or something. But what I couldn't understand was he'd flown up one of the buttes and there was no ridge, right? Because we we're just ridge soaring at this point. So yeah. like, how the hell did you manage to get way down there when there was no ridge, you know? I said, oh, it was easy. It was, it was a thermal, you know? I'm like, oh, thermal, sweet. What's that? <laughs> you know, let, let explain. And he's like, oh, it's really easy, man. He said, you're going to go up East Cremont Butte, fly out over the gravel pit, and you'll feel that, you know, the, the air moving and lifting and just start turning your glider around and you'll go up and get as high as you can and just point it. I like, oh, that sounds fantastic. So I'm determined to do that the very next day. So I go up East Grobon by myself, three o'clock in the afternoon. It's howling windy, which at this point I think is exactly what you want because <laughs> I'm flying small gliders and we're trying to rich saw, right? So yeah, this looks good. I'm on an, an Adele Aero, which was this one of the early ellipticals, supposedly more of an intermediate glider. It had a mesh front and little fiberglass battens. <laughs> this is in 1990, and we had no reserves, just to add to that. <laughs> so I go flying out over the, the gravel pit and hit the stern, which immediately just wipes my wing out completely. <laughs> And I start spiraling towards the ground, and I'm sure I just threw my hands above my head in terror. And the glider miraculously reopened, and I crossed the power lines and crossed the highway and sat it down in the McDonald's car park, right, shaking like a leaf. And I had two buddies who were sitting about a mile away in front of me, and I said, oh, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to fly and watch. They were watching the whole thing from their couch. And I disappeared behind like the Kmart or something, so they called 911. <laughs> About two minutes later, an ambulance comes roaring in and cop cars, and I'm like, it's like shaking and packing my shit up. I remember going back and going to John Patterson, man, you can stick your thermals. I'm <laughs> keeping away from that. But that was definitely the start of XC flying in Jackson Hole, which now is what 200 miles is the record. Yeah, though. and uh, which you were, which you witnessed, you were there for that many years is, later. Many yeah. years later, yeah. And, <laughs> But like the JP and and Hunt and you guys and who did you say the instructor was? Kirk. Kirk Kleiner was there was there in the late eighties and then he was more of a base jumper type, and he ended up um, coming down here in Texas. I mean, he was a national parks guy, and they sent him off to one of these hmm. parks down here, which 
kind of freed us all because then there was no we had no instructions so it was better we were all <laughs> just figuring it out you know there was, we were in an area where, you know a lot of times you'll get an instructor seems to take quite a strong grip personality wise on an area and i think because kurt bailed and no one really filled the void we just had this weird little niche Nate's got this story when he learned that you know the guy that t- uh, taught him he took him up Greenhorn and at home and in Wood River Valley and and he he brought, brought him up the hill and they flew off and they landed and the guy said okay now you know as much as I know you know that was like <laughs> like one flight that's about right is it kind of like that I mean the place where Kurt taught us is, is hilarious like when you look at it now you can't even imagine how you could fly a paraglider without it was in this gully you know backside of a thing and. And with those, we all had the same size glide, same size gliders that we were learning on. And I was really annoyed that my other friends were getting off the ground and getting so much higher, and I couldn't get up. And I'm running down the hill, and thinking my technique's poor. It's just I was the heaviest one in the group. Obviously, <laughs> I don't even know if I actually got that far, ten or fifteen feet off the ground, probably. <laughs> and did, did JP have like a? I mean, because at that point the hangings were had figured out some XC. So did, did he know no. thermals existed? I mean, did, did well, he we didn't know? Really, the, the, the hang glider pilots that were around didn't really fly Jackson much. Yeah. They went more over to Idaho. Yeah. Um, they were with King and Owens. And, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, Black Tail Butte, or that big butte out there in the middle. Yeah. Southern Butte. Southern Butte. Um, and there wasn't many of them. And I, I think JP was... You know, we had Salt Lake City and Point of the Mountain as a contact point. But it was funny, like, we were all very isolated little islands. Jackson Hole was an island, Sun Valley was an island, you know, Utah was an island. And then Joe Glazinski, we were all on these all ratty old gliders. And then Joe Glazinski, who was a sort of rolling pro design rep, heard that there was this bunch of potential cl- uh, pilots up in Jackson Hole. So he came rolling up. I and mean, this is how funny it was in these days. He gives Hunt a Challenger C, Protozone Challenger C, which would be the equivalent of you know a D or a CCC glider at this point. You know, John's been flying one of these Excalibur bags of rags things that doesn't go anywhere. And we went up Phillips, and John launched and went straight up and crossed the valley for the first time. And I, t- I remember turning to Joe and I said, oh, that's a sale. <laughs> Which it was, how it flew the hell out of that challenge to see for the next couple of years. Mm-hmm. But the kind of gliders we got put on, quite terrifying. Same mm-hmm. thing happened to me. I went back to New Zealand and I ended up being sold this ragged out Advance Omega 2 with race lines that was by a German instructor that was way above my my, my uh, skill level. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was way too heavy handed. So I used to spin that thing regularly in Jackson Hole. They called me the spin doctor at one point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, without reserves. Uh, at that point, we had a uh, we'd moved up to the Von Blondes that I think would have broken all the bones in my dog's body if he'd <laughs> thrown it because they they were tiny these little things. But we thought they were great because we had a reserve. You know. <laughs> I'm really glad I never threw my Von Blonde. <laughs> <laughs> Descent rated twelve meters or something. <laughs> they would. I mean, they they. I don't know how big they were. But they were tiny in the bag, so they kind of done much good. <laughs> But it was a step forward. Yeah, right. So you were doing, at this point, you were going back and forth every year? So you're spending the... I, I went back and forth a couple of times. I was all over the place. Um, I was still doing a bunch of climbing. Uh, in 93, um, you know, I was still very un- interested in this idea of what was becoming extreme sports at, the, at this point. Yeah. You know? And uh, I was trying to organize different athletes and do some management stuff and I had all these uh, these grand ideas that were probably ten years ahead of their time, but I I was I had some contact with MTV Sports, uh, which was you know the, the very hip extreme yeah. channel at the time, and I sure. was tr- I was pitching them this like multi sport Jackson Hole thing that we just about had it agreed on, and then at the very last and I was going to bungee jump out of the tram, that was going to be part of it, and then at the very last minute the mountain sold sold and changed hands, and the new owners didn't want anything to do with it. But I'd gone out to New York and I'd seen, been talking to MTV and one of the producers had asked me, you know, are there any other sort of things you'd like to do? I thought, oh, yeah, there's lots of things I'd like to do. And I'd been reading all up about Ecuador and I was like, oh, I'd love to go on paraglide off Cotopaxi in Ecuador. I just very randomly threw, threw this that at him. Out, right. So then 
six months later, I'm in Jackson skiing for the winter, completely forgotten about it. And I get a phone call from MTV Sports and they're like, oh, we've got a thing going to Ecuador next week. You think you'd like to be part of it? And da, 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 da. So next thing I knew, I couldn't even find anyone else to go with me. And so in 93, I went with MTV Sports to, to Ecuador and I flew off almost the summit of Cotopaxi with a helmet on my head that's about the size of your coffee machine over there. <laughs> I mean, with a camera on my head that was just gigantic to blur the days. And yeah, we got lucky. We got up up through the cloud early in the morning and and flew pretty close to Cotope- the summer of Cotopaxi in 93. And uh, Andre Agassi and Dan Cortez introduced me in the start of the MTV Sports. Get out of segment. here. Yeah. And I was down with Hans Ray, who was the great uh, mountain bike you know, downhiller yeah. and, and trials rider. He did this really cool segment in Ecuador, uh, bouncing around on the stairs and the cars and the things. And yeah. all these three kids were chasing him around. We almost caused a riot. It was awesome. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. Um, I did that on a, on a, uh, a Dell Space. Okay, yeah. An early Dell that, that, that Adele gave me. And then I had this, this Omega 2 that I was telling you about. Tried to, it tried to kill me. I pounded in pretty hard in Jackson Hole and managed to walk away from it. And it was getting really ragged at this point. All the boys were like, you, you know, you've know, got to get a new glider. I really need the money. Um, and what are I, you doing for work at this point? You know, I had, a, I had a bungee jump, sort of an underground bungee jump company going in Jackson Hole. And it was pre-tandems. So, what, Were they doing tandems in Jackson yet? Not no. yet. Okay. Not yet. No, when this happened. It was getting close. Um, but I went to New York on some other thing. And when I arrived in the city, they smashed in the windows of my car almost immediately and stole my Omega 2, which probably saved my life in retrospect. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You've never been so happy to lose something in your life. Yeah, that one was probably ready to go. I mean, it was just ragged out. And then, uh, you know, once again, just good luck and lots of weird collisions and paragliding as I had a good friend in San Francisco area who was a sail maker, big, big boat sail maker yeah. like yacht, and yacht racer. Like North or something, yeah. Yeah, but he had his own loft. It's yeah. now part of one of those. I forget what it is. Um, but their sails were all being made in Hong Kong in some factory. Yeah. And he was like, oh. They make paragliders in the same factory that was making our sales. He's like, you want to see if I can hook you up? And that ended up getting me connected with Pro Design, John Yates, back in, in the States. So he started sponsoring me, and I was on the team with a 17-year-old Josh Cohn uh, and a 15-year-old Zach Hosington, who, know, who was almost as good as Josh in those days, and he's gone on to be like a NASA engineer. Really? And I mean, uh, yeah, Josh was a pretty exceptional pilot even at 17. Yeah. And I've known a lot of really good pilots all over the world. And Josh is, is really one of the world's top pilots, in my opinion, certainly for his incredible consistency. Yeah. And how long he's been flying at such a high level. The bot. Yeah, I think that, that nickname came about a decade later. Mm. Um, but John Yates, who was who owned Pro, who was importing pro design into the states i think he hired me because i was the only one old enough to drink with him and drive the van so he figured he'd sponsor me yeah these two kids and i, I spent a lot of time driving the black yates van chasing josh <laughs> uh but that got me into competition uh you know pro design gave me a a uh, contest and it was the wing of the time. And I went off to my first competition, which was the Mitch match, which Mitch McAleer, the acrobatic hand glider pilot, uh, put on in Elsinore. And there was 16, 16 pilots in it, um, which looking back was a pretty funny group. And it included all the top US pilots. And this young English kid that was strutting around with a bunch of tattoos and just seemed like he was, you know, totally trying to run the show uh and i was like oh who's this guy and they're like oh that's robbie whittle and i'm like that's not robbie whittle robbie whittle's like 45 years old and flies hand gliders and has socks up to his knees you know and i had no idea that rob was actually younger than me and <laughs> and and now flying exclusively paraglider so that was when robbie whittle first turned up 
and the States. And then Rob and I would end up spending a lot of time together over the next few years. Uh, and uh, So at that point, he'd already won in hang gliding? Or and, he was still no, hang getting gliding, ready? Hang, hang gliding was the first one he won when he was 19. He was 19? Yeah. And oh. then he came back and he won the paragliding when he was like 23. And he went to Korea to work with Adele for a start. And then he ended up ending up in Sun Valley with Adele USA, which is how he came into our orbit. Mm. Sun Valley had a really interesting uh, and exceptional group of pilots that Greg Smith assembled that included Dave Bridges, two times national champion, who later died with Alex Lowe in Tibet uh, climbing, and uh, Chris Santa Croce and Robbie and Nate Scales and Othar were both teenagers as well. That's one of the really things I love about paragliding is in my 20s, it was the absolute perfect sport to be a lunatic 20-year-old. And now in my 50s, it's the perfect sport to be a quasi-retired 50-year-old. <laughs> so it's been just <laughs> progressing with me nicely. Yeah, so Robbie, <laughs> you guys were roommates. Yeah, Rob dropped and I, acid together. You guys have, have a lot I, of history together. I right? wouldn't know about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Rob's been a big influence on me just as a friend, mm. for sure. Um, and uh, But yeah, I mean, Rob will keeps reappearing in the story, for sure. So yeah, we had the Chelan Nationals. And then uh, there was a couple of great Venezuelan pilots, the Cat Cassatomac brothers, who were importing APCO into... Miami, and I had been spending some time with them, and, and they were like, oh man, you got to go to Venezuela, Venezuela is so cool, you know, so I went down, I took off to Venezuela, and it turned out they were having this new competition there that was going to be called Paragliding World Cup, and I've only really recently realized that I think it was actually the very first Paragliding World Cup, because when I look the on first the, PWC? When I look on the PWC history it's the first one that they have results for. So that's 96 96 yeah, yeah and xavier murillo had put the whole thing together and it was just a legendary they 250 something pilots entered and they didn't tell anybody no <laughs> so almost every, everybody came right <laughs> robbie whittle actually was one of the few that they said no to because robbie had waited so long to put his entry in that they were like no you just can't come we've got two 250 people have turned up, right? So we had this first ever PWC in Venezuela, and for the first two or three tasks, they actually, 250 of us flew. Jeez. And we broke it down then into an A comp and a B comp. Two <laughs> comps were like 120. Because it, it was just too much chaos. I was chaos. I mean, it was crazy. And we had a Le Mans start one day. Really? Yeah, well, we laid all the gliders out, and everybody went up the hill. And we ran down and took off. <laughs> oh, classic. That was super cool. Oh, that's awesome. But I'd gone there about a month or two, month, six weeks earlier, and I'd ended up uh, in this great flying house with, and that was close to Loma Lisa where we were having the comp, run by Orlando and Marie. I know they're still there. So hi, Orlando. Hi, Marie. I um, still want to come back. Lo Loma Lisa in Venezuela, if you ask me the best place I've ever flown in the world, I would personally say it was Loma Lisa in Venezuela. And I know a lot of pilots who flew there in 96 still think that. Really? But I'm in this little house in the jungle, and it's me and these two young guys. I've got a 19-year-old Rashad Delon, who I think I'd already met. I think Rashad had already come over for the Kings Mountain Nationals. I get them a bit mixed up. Uh, and Raul Rodriguez who was like 17 or something, yeah. right? And so I'm like, we're going up the little hill behind the jungle house and Roll's doing his thing every day. And I'm just like, couldn't even barely look at him. And Rashad was like, oh, this guy's going to change the sport, man, which turned out to be very accurate. Yeah. So yeah, I want to just, you know, Rashad passed this week uh, on his 47th birthday and he was a good friend and had a lot of good adventures with Rashad. So we've got some good RG stories. <laughs> tucked away in here um, he was amazing man he could learn a language in like five days wow and Venezuela here's a good Rashad story we uh, had this incredible task you know we were playing these like 100k tasks and, and in the early 90s and the yeah. conditions were just fantastic 
And this day I didn't make it to goal. We went down at the last turn point, which I was a bit bummed out about. And we went down this big, quite nice looking ranch, you know. And typical sort of US mentality, I'm trying to sneak out of there without being seen. And there's this big, beautiful house up on this sort of mound. And I'm coming around the corner and this guy comes out. He, he looks down and goes, hey, he says, what's, what's your PWC number? He said, we've had vans coming by. He said, we're, we're having a barbecue. Why don't you come up? So I go up there, and this guy's having a carnival party, and he's got all these models from Caracas. And him, and, and Rashad had already landed, so he was already up there. And there was a couple of men. There was a German girl that crashed out on the outskirts of the farm, and then she was fine. They were just doing a rescue, but it was obviously going to take a few hours. So I know Rashad and I passed on at least two vans and stayed at this carnival party to all hours. We got this German girl out of the, out of the jungle. It was really a super fun afternoon, evening. <laughs> and then they end up, and it had just been an incredible day of flying, huh? and they threw me in the back of the, this pickup truck. I remember we were driving back to, to La Victoria. And I mean, my whole... Again, like it's tingling sensations up and down my whole body, like I've been doing a bunch of drugs. And, and I'm looking, I, it was the first time I'd been flying in meters per second because we'd always flown in feet per minute. So yeah. I converted all my instruments over, but I still didn't really know what it meant. Yeah. And then I was like, well, we're getting like sevens and eights and things. Like it was a really booming day. Yeah. And I was kind of doing these calculations and just realizing how strong the lift it had been and what a great day it had been. And, we got back to the hotel and I had a girlfriend down there with me. She was all worried because it was like midnight. And, you know, we haven't got in reaches or yeah. cell phones or anything like this. Yeah. Like, who knows where you are, you know? And I and Jockey Sanderson and a bunch of the cats were there. And I came in and I was like, oh, man, I, I just had the best day of my life, you know? And they would start laughing. Like, man, people don't, aren't usually that happy when they don't make gold. <laughs> 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 but, but it just been such an epic day from start to finish. So for what making gold wasn't even an issue. Right. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and this is you're so you're still flying for pro design then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's when I was really starting to get into it. And then in yeah, ninety five, ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight, probably my my prime years in the States. Um, and also when I started to go to South America more. Um I remember I was thinking to go to Europe to fly PWC the following season in the spring. Dave Bridges goes to me, goes, Kiwi, he says, you know, I want to know what it's like flying PWC in Europe. He said, stand in a shower and rip up hundred dollar bills. <laughs> says, sounds like, it sounds like going boating. <laughs> yeah. He says, the place you want to go is Bay de Bravo, Mexico. Mm. This was 96. Wow. Uh, and so I heat and I'd actually met Miguel Gutierrez at that point. We'd been working together in Aspen. Um, and had Pinon been? Were they flying Pinon already then? Barely. Okay. Yeah. Chris, Chris, and Santa Croce and Dave and Robbie had gone down there because of Miguel. Yeah. Miguel Gutierrez was, you know, at that time one of the world's top hang glider pilots. Yeah. He'd gotten, I think, third or fourth in the Owens and been leading the comp till the last day. Um, but then he had back issues, so he couldn't really fly hangs very more, much more. So he took up paragliding pretty seriously in Mexico in the mid nineties. And the Pinon, there's a lot of hang gliders in Bay in those days, obviously, you know, mm -hmm. but there weren't many paragliders. Um, so I was down there for the winter of '96. Um, well, basically, what happened was I tried to to drive to Ecuador. I tried to move to Ecuador. I decided I was leaving the states and I was going to set up in Ecuador. And I had a bit of a disastrous trip. My traveling partner crashed and broke his back in Iguala and was paralyzed, ended up being paralyzed for life. And then he died. And I'd been his instructor. Um, I'm, to this day, I've thought about that day, obviously, many, many times. And I think he passed out in a spiral dive because he was a very good athlete and uh, top extreme skier and what have you. And, He'd been getting into doing his spirals, and I was like, well, mate, if you need your spirals, just do them high. And in Iguala, we'd, I'd flown cross-country and then gone back up to get the truck, and he, he had thousands of feet to play with. It was right at the end of the day, and he never pulled his reserve. Who knows what, he, what exactly happened, but I definitely think this is, 
there's a lot of that goes on that yeah. people, more than people realize yeah um and so that was really cut pretty tough having a good friend that you're taught how to fly mess himself up and then those years just got really kind of crazy 96 97 98 it was like a, carnage crazy yeah it was definitely we were right we were right on the edge we were sort of i think there was something strange going on with the design that they hadn't really figured out or we pushing it too hard or whatever um i flew my i threw my reserve twice in one year at the pwc in venezuela on the practice day chasing andy here to go through some saddle and that went fine and then i think the next year i threw it in chelan above the butte on my birthday Robbie always said he'd never throw his reserve. He threw his like twice in six months. Like everybody I knew was chucking reserves. Bill Belcourt broke his neck mm. at Kings. It was just a lot of carnage. Mm. And I, my love for the sport was kind of what had waned pretty hard at that point. Didn't you tell me a, a story about Robbie throwing at Chelan? That was, was that Chelan that he threw right? It was like one of these deals where he kept trying to press forward, press forward. For, was that Robbie? No. Okay. Rob never. Right. Rob threw in Australia, never threw in Chelan, I okay. don't think. I don't know, you'd have to ask him. Yeah. But um, no, the first time I went up Chelan Butte ever, we drove up and uh, Monty Bell threw right above us and came down on top of the Butte under reserve and just packed up, relaunched while we're getting <laughs> our stuff ready. And meanwhile, you know, the funny thing about flying in America in those days was everywhere we went, we were being told we were going to die. You know, the idea of having a paragliding competition in Chelan Butte in the mid-90s was highly controversial. Sure. And the parag the hang glider pilots were not happy about it at all. At all. Um, and that was a, that's a good Robbie, Robbie Whittle story, is him, they came rallying up the Butte, and they had this big pickup truck, and he had Nate and Otha with him. And, uh, you know, he rallies to a stop, they got the doors open, and music's on, they're blaring tune, and, you know, strutting around and you can see this little group of hang glider pilots just getting all pissed off so finally the one of these guys comes over and he goes up to robbie and he goes oh you know some of us have come up here for some peace and quiet and robbie looks at him and he goes really i've come up here to rock <laughs> <laughs> and the guy just turns around and goes back to his buddies confused and someone's like ah uh, that's robbie will uh <laughs> You're screwed, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually one of the funniest things I've ever seen. <laughs> but yeah, it was very controversial every we And you know, I mean, looking back, we were talking with Larry Tudor, you know, when they had the first uh, idea that we we're going to rate pilots and be safer, you know, we had a P3 structure. And to get a P3 in the early 90s for your first couple of years, you had to do a full stall and a negative spin on your glider above the ground that was the requirement yeah for like it would now be like an advanced intermediate you know right which was just crazy looking back yeah. and it was kind of the same with the competitions we really went the strongest places in some places that i mean we had two comps at king's mountain that were incredible yeah. but really considering the equipment we were flying on in the 90s pretty wild that was i think the first time i met rashad because he turned up for that summer and he, he was so hilarious like he was just caning everybody but he kept landing like 50 feet short of goal or something like he would he would be like 30 k's ahead of us and he'd be full bulk barring in and he'd not make you keep coming short of the goal line and <laughs> doing all this crazy stuff it's like 19 he was so wild and then one day he's he, he after he's going kiwis it was so cool he was up at like 17, 18,000 feet or something, right? Yeah. And I saw this, I was under this cloud and I see this, what's happening with this cloud? So I go to the cloud, it's snow, Kiwi. <laughs> My harness is filling with snow. It was so cool. <laughs> 18,500 feet all by himself. It was you know? so cool, literally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then he goes and bombs 50 <laughs> yards short of goal again. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing that you guys were, they were throwing comps at King back in the at day King. on that stuff. I mean, they don't even have comps there now. No. no. I don't think one person flew there last year. No, well, after Bill broke his neck, I think that was when we probably came to our senses. Mm. Mm. And fortunately, 
you know, his fees recovered from that. Yeah. It was, no, you'd never know. Right, sure. Um, and that was like, I mean, it was such a little brotherhood in those days. Was so this that when was, the pro design Adele thing was going on? You were on one team or the other? There was a bit of that going on. But yeah. in reality, when, when you know, I mean, Bill's accident's a classic example. Bill, it was the last task, and we all saw Bill crash. And then Josh Cohn and Robbie landed beside him in very strong conditions like that. And that, that, that alone was amazing. Mm. Dave Bridges and Will Gadd flew to the bottom we self-organized the rescue even without the organization we had the ambulance there will and dave led these two overweight emt guys up to bill and and uh they pull out the oxygen and they're like oh you know you want some oxygen and bell court goes i think you guys need some first <laughs> Take care of yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> I can see you're hurting. <laughs> yeah. And so the whole comp, you know, Otha won. And that was the year I think you won. OJ won the Nationals. And he was out in front, so he didn't know. But everybody behind it just stopped and and, and self-organized this rescue, you know. Because mm. that's how it was in those days. It was a right. little, little brotherhood. It's quite an amazing <laughs> group, the original U.S. pilots that got it going in these different places. Mm. You know. Or, and Ro Robbie was living in Sun Valley then, or was that when you guys were living together? Oh, no, Robbie Driggs? was in Sun Valley. Well, he might have moved to Driggs by then. He, once he left Adele, he started working for Firebird, and then he moved to – then Ozone started. Yep. That was when he left the States, and which is fortunate for me because Ozone have definitely done a lot to keep me in paragliding. Um, and then I went – I was went with um, – saw those guys in the early years when they started – the early 2000s uh, was my sort of my few seasons in Europe. But after that kind of the, that stretch that was, there was a lot of carnage and stuff. Did you I took a go away from it? Yeah, I long? took a step back from racing. And then that sort of coincided with the whole Ozone adventure was Ozone really took a step away from racing when it started. Hmm. Um, you know, people don't, well, they tried to start a serial class for the PWC uh, and that, I think, lasted one or two seasons. And then when that sort of failed, Ozone, as a manufacturer, in the early days, were kind of like, well, we're not really that interested in racing, which is ironic now. Yeah. Uh, and Robbie and Bob Jury were going to India, starting the whole Volbiv thing, or some of the early, you know, pioneers. And Acro came along, which the Octane was a, was a good, you know, early wing. Four. So Ozone sort of capitalized in the early days on their in intermediate market a lot, I think. Mm. And that's what I was flying. I flew for 15 years. I flew DHV2 gliders. Yeah. yeah, so by like 97, 98, I ended up, I was, my trip to Ecuador had not happened or fallen to pieces. And I'd ended up back in the States. And, and Robbie was getting ready to move to Europe. And uh, I was flying... Uh, uh, the Pro Design Max at this point. And I, I don't know what was going on with the gliders in 97 or 98, but they mustn't have had any cord in them or something, but they were very prone to spin and and collapse quite radically. And certainly none of the, not much of the internal structure like the gliders do now. So my Max had this habit that every time I would give it a decent amount of bar, it would never really have asymmetrics. It would just do this sort of like more like today's gliders, these monster full frontals that would just come down and almost slap you in the face, the leading edge that against the rises and then reopen violently. And you'd end up, I, I would end up spinning the thing, right? There was one task at Kings Mountain when I spun it three times on the way to gold. Right? And it's, so I'm like, and then I'm seeing pilots much more talented than me, like Robbie and these guys, they're all so Got their, got their hands full, you know, and I'm starting to think maybe this is not such a good idea for me. And Dave Bridges and I was working uh, tandems for Dave and Aspen in 98. I remember one of the last conversations I had with him, he was telling me that he thought racing was getting too dangerous and he was going to go back to mountaineering Jeez. to give him something else to do. And then he ended up getting killed climbing like a year later. 
And it was about that point that I decided I was going to flip the coin and move to New Orleans, Louisiana, which is about as far away from paragliding as you can get in the United States. And, uh, you know, I have this kind of split personality where there's the outdoor paragliding climber skier personality. And there's also the writer, photographer, underground personality. So these two personalities tend to, you know, flip backwards and forwards a lot. Um, and so in 98 or 99, I, I made the move to New Orleans, which definitely sent my paragliding career in a completely different uh direction for the, like the next 15 years or more. Um, I became heavily involved in the Burning Man community from 99 on, and that was always the same weekend for years as the U.S. Nationals. The U.S. Nationals were always on Memorial Day weekend. I think Josh Cohn got that change because he wanted to go to Burning Man. <laughs> but for, for a, very, a lot of years, I just forgot, completely forgot about racing. Huh. Um and then, like I said, I ended up going to Europe, I think 2000 and 2001, and was around for the start of Ozone. And, you know, Ozone's become this big behemoth of a company, but the, there wasn't very many people involved for a start. They all worked really hard. Those first few years were a lot of fun. In uh, 2001, I drove to the World Championships in Sierra Nevada and Granada, with Russ Ogden and Matt Taggart. I'd already, Russ had, I don't know, Russ had just started working for Ozone. I think I'd actually met him before he started working for Ozone at a British team training thing in Castajon. So we drive down to these 2001 Sierra, Sierra Nevada Worlds, which personally I think must go down as the scariest world championships of all time. The carnage in 2001 in Spain and Granada was crazy. Um, I watched Andy Hedegaard break his foot top landing on one of the practice days. I think the entire Australian team went to the hospital before the event even started. Holy I may get in trouble for that statement, <laughs> but it was crazy. I mean, what, it, what happened was they kept setting tasks in front of Granada, Sierra Nevada is this giant volcano in southern Spain. We, we were in this, it was like 40 k's up the road to the village. It was just a winter village. So we're up there in summer, the only ones up there. It was really crazy. And they kept doing these tasks sort of in front. And there was over with these canyons and things. And it was just carnage. It was like the first year the pods came out. Hmm. I watched Jim spin down through the gaggle i think josh took a big spin on a pod the pods were quite a not quite worked out mm. there was a lot of carnage jane eh? there was also some pretty cr crazy good flying one day they did a hundred kilometer triangle out in front and then we did 40 k's off the back or 50 k's to the beach so we launched in the snow and we got super high that day for a lot of people it was the highest they'd ever gotten in europe we got to like over sixteen thousand feet whoa um, but yeah, we did, they did this hundred K triangle out in front that I did a little bit of, and then did this big, super long glide to the beach in the back. It was really cool Wow! to launch. And I think it's the only time we ever launched in the snow and landed in the sand. And what was the, was the carnage mostly due to these canyons and stuff, or was it like rotor and wind and all of the above and, and just where the gear, where the equipment was, uh, it was starting to get better. I mean, this is where Robbie and Ozone were advocating for a serial yep. class, yep. which, you know, ironically got canned because they said it was too, da too dangerous because pilots would try too hard on serial class gliders, which I never really understood that. Yeah, right. Uh, especially now, I think it's really a shame that we don't have a PWC-style uh, competitions for serial, serial class, class D-class gliders because... Mm. They're so good these days. Like every, so kind of like something between like the Le Chab Open or one of the Ozones and a PwC, something that's... Well, like, it would be nice. Oh, if, serial class. Yeah. It would be great if, you know, we could just have a serial class PwC. Like They had two classes, which yeah. was good. Yeah. But the PwC as it is, is full. So it's not like, you know, you'd right. almost need another whole... Right, whole other class. But they're so inspirational, the serial class deep class gliders of this era mm. like i think that early dream of a serial class 
would have been perfect for the Xenos or the Ice Peak Sixes or now the Leopards, you know. And mm. you're seeing these gliders doing, I mean, guys fly Leopards in PWCs and do quite well on them. So. Sure, yeah. 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 So that was actually my first uh, article for Cross Country Magazine. That started my long relationship wow. with Hugh Miller and Cross Country. Um, and I remember I'd been I, we're driving down there and I was telling Matt Taggart that I thought I'd might try and write an article for Cross Country about it. He's going, oh, yeah, Hugh, Hugh won't, he won't print it. He won't be interested. In it. I was like, oh, well, I'm just going to have a go anyway. So I was kind of taking notes and I'd already like written half of it when I first met Hugh. And I said, I'm a writer, you know. Oh, yeah. And I said, I've actually been working. I thought, oh, really? I can I have a look? So I, he sat down and he, he started reading it. He read like three pages and he's like, yeah, we'll, we'll print this. Cool. And that was the start of what's been a long relationship with those guys, which has been great. Yeah, that's 20 years. Yeah. yeah. Of getting hired and fired and hired and fired. <laughs> uh, and I also, uh, Kite World Magazine, which is one of their spin-offs, I was the feature editor for that for a couple of years, mm. which was fun as well. But yeah, I think that 2000 Worlds also, was, I was just like, man, these guys are crazy. Mm. They can have this. Yeah. Like racing stuff. Right. And uh so my own my my own flying career sort of mimicked where Ozone was going at that point because they put a lot of emphasis into their intermediate gliders. Mm. So I was perfectly happy to fly those for years. And then the kite surfing thing kind of took over my life a little bit. And there was a few years there where I just didn't really fly. That's would, when you went down to Cabaret Day and all that? Yeah, I yeah. I they started Kite World and Hugh's like, right, you're going to come and write for Kite World because it's going to be a much bigger magazine than cross country. And I was like, well, I don't like kite surfing. And, and uh, you know, I just I don't really want to do it. I like, oh, no, 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 it'll be great. So they're all right, we got your, we got your lessons in Tarifa. You're going to go to Tarifa, Spain. Oh, that's the thing. I didn't know how to kite. So I'm like, well, how can I write for a kite surfing magazine if I don't know how to kite? <laughs> And at that point, no one really knew how to kite, so it wasn't that big of a deal. But so they sent me off to Tarifa um, to learn, and it rains for like two weeks. And, and, and then I'm just getting sick of this. And then I get a call from Robbie, and they're going to teens to a glacier to dip what, for the very first snow kites that they've just been developing. So I end up, I fly to Spain to go to the beach, and I end up on teen, in the glacier and teens with Pascal Joubert and some of these early, early snow kite guys. And then I think I wrote the first article about snow kiting ever in that, in that issue. Wow. Um, which was kind of a weird. And then, so then I come back to the States and you know, living in New Orleans and then the closest spot, they're like, oh, there's a guy in Cabaret, he'll give you some lessons in the Dominican Republic. And I'm a pretty well-traveled person, but I had to actually look up where the Dominican Republic was on a map had no clue and then i went there and ended up buying a house uh and then that was kind of base camp for a few years and the flying just kind of fell off i really wasn't flying i went to india for the first time in 2000 or 2001 and beer with a handful of guys it was really really fun was that with with jim and eddie and jim, yeah, john and those jim, guys? jim malice and Eddie and John were there, Jim was. Jim Mallis and I had met uh, in Spain uh, in Pedro Hita the mm. season before. And um, he is a Sanskrit scholar. He knows a PhD in Sanskrit from Oxford. And uh, I'd always been interested in these Kumbha Melas, these giant gatherings that they have. And and uh, I thought it had been that year that I, I missed it. And... and uh, Jim was like, no, no, it's next year. He said, I'm going to be there. I'll be there with my guru. You know, he would go there and he would actually camp with the sadhus right in the middle of the craziness. You know, there's 20 million people in these camps. Yeah. Um, and, and and I was like, oh, I'm, I want to go to the mailer. You know, he's like, oh, yeah. And so he, he scribbled me down a few instructions on a piece of paper. And then six months later, I went to India for the first time and managed to actually find them. <laughs> 
which amazed everybody. And 20 million people. Yeah, and that's another story, which I probably can't tell here. Um, <laughs> you can tell anything here. Yeah, no, I'm not going to tell that one. Uh, but that was how I ended up in India the first time with with those guys. Hmm. And then I met, and, and uh, when I first went to Bear, I got super sick. Like, we got some guys in the airport saw me, my paraglider bag, and there were a couple of French guys who were going to Bear, who had been there before, and we all traveled up together on the bus and we go and then we ate something at one restaurant we got super sick like india sick yeah you know nasty yeah and i thought i was going to die in the emaho and and bruce mills who was the new zealand pilot who sort of helped develop the area he was coming around and checking on me and that and when i met him we sort of put it together that he had been the mentor of the guys that had been my mentor back in New Zealand in the mid 80s. Jeez. So it was like this kind of strange connection all the way back to the start once again. Um, I mean, I love beer. Beer's a really cool place. It's been interesting to watch it keep developing yeah, over, the, over the years and the way the flying's developed and the way the town's developed and, and everything else. So you go through this period of kind of early 2000s not flying a ton and when i met you in 2014 you were really kind of coming back to it that's kind of when you came back to comps right yeah i mean i did a bit of you know a little bit of traveling and adventure flying i always had always had a glider in the in the closet um and my i got married i was living in new orleans and my ex-wife's family have a condo in telluride which was fantastic so i got to a bunch of flying in telluride uh, with Jeff Crystal, who's the local legend. Uh, and then in 2011, part of this was to do with my immigration status. I, when I got married and I got pretty much stuck in the States, there was a number of years there I couldn't travel outside of the United States, getting my green card sorted out. So that definitely slowed me down for the flying. And I must have got my, my green card back in 2011. Well, I got my green card in 2011. And the first trip I did was to Peru with Jeff Crystal. Um, and there's this, uh, you know, paragliding it opens some crazy doors for you sometimes. Like, it's amazing the opportunities you can get from this very strange, obscure sport. But we turn up in Lima, Peru, and we're flying at the coast. And we're hanging out with the local pilots. And Jeff's kind of well-known down there. He's got a Peruvian wife. And these guys are like, oh, do you want to come to this place called Sondorami with us next week and fly in this reenactment of an Incan battle? So basically what happened is we, we go down to this place, down towards Cusco, and they have a reenactment of a battle between an Incan tribe and the local tribe that got wiped out and they get 5,000 university students and they dress them up in full regalia and they do a reenactment of this battle but it's also tied into a very old tradition where the local boys for a manhood test they would dig a pit and they would cover it with bamboo and offal and when a condor landed on top of the pit the boy had to reach up through the sticks and grab the condor by the legs what and the? capture it. Holy hell. So they had captured three condors for this event, which they released from this pyramid, and they wanted us to fly our paragliders off the pyramid at the same time as the Whoa. condors. Oh, awesome. Right? So only me and Jeff and one Peruvian guy actually managed to get off this little postage stamp of a pyramid. <laughs> and I just recently found these photos again. I just posted them recently. I must do an article about it because it was such a crazy event. And then we're like thermaling up with the condors and there's this giant battle going on below and there's fires and there's a shaman and skins and Whoa. it was wild. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, it, it just like, I mean, and because we had paragliders, they're like, oh, we want you guys to, you know, be in the middle of this ancient reenactment ritual it was so bizarre in Cusco isn't that where the tandem pilots 
put like these kind of skis underneath their harnesses because the air is so thin. So when they come in, rather than trying to run it out, you know, if there's not some wind or something, they, they just land on their butts and skid it out. It's quite possible. We're a ways away from there. Oh, that is. Down, okay. Down south. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, because yeah, Cusco is like 11,000 or something. Sondorami. So then from there, Jeff and I went to Juarez, which is the center of the climbing in Peru, El Pameo, Huascaran, all the biggest peaks. And we went up there to do some adventure flying. And cross country get in touch with me. And they go, oh, there's this guy down there. He's trying to organize this thing, Peter Chernowski. And he wants to organize a X Andes. And, and we want you, you know, meet up with him and maybe do an article on this thing. And I was like, oh, it sounds interesting. He was in the area. And it turned out that Xavier Merlo was with him. Um, and, you know, I had known Zav since the first the first PwC in Venezuela. I remember going up to, you know, being pretty nervous. Because it was this huge comp, you know, all these legends. and What's it going to be like? I don't know. First task briefing and Xavier comes out. And he's wearing an Eddie, ha- Eddie Hash t-shirt with a big marijuana leaf on it you know and i'm like oh, okay this is gonna be all right this wild french guy and you know these days we took we took photos which every i don't know how much people remember about the old days of racing but we took these turn point photos yeah. pre-gps's yeah. and the the way zev and this they would process the photos that night they would give us these box cameras everyone would hand their box camera and we'd stick a pin in the map where we thought we landed, right, which is immediate source of argument, right, and then we would have to hand in the camera to prove it that, right, that show we were in these different sectors, right. So they would then process all these films at night, Jeez. and the task, the race committee, like Zab, would look at all the photos to see that you're in the zones, right, and then it, and so he's dealing with all these different nationalities and his way of dealing with like other pilots explaining why they weren't in the zone or whatever. It was just so classic looking back. He was so good at, so good with people. Um, he was really the heart and soul, right? Of the PwC, he, he, the you know. PwC was his baby, you know? Yeah. Um, Guy Anderson told me a funny story that there was a year in, in the Brits, British Nationals, where the guy lost the British Championship because he didn't take the helmet photo of his number. <laughs> You had to take a photo of your helmet with your number and the task board and all these things. This guy would have won the whole British championships. He got DQ because he can take his helmet photo. <laughs> oh, <man>. oh, God. <laughs> that would be a rough one. Yeah, it would. So anyway, we're in Huaraz, which is a beautiful place, but really, like, I, I mean, I've flown in the Himalayas. I've flown all over the place. Peru's full on, and it's windy, and there's these. we were probably a little late, and there's these deep, deep valleys that you drop down into, like oh, I was getting blown back out of stuff. I started just landing on top of things and walking down because it was just crazy. It was mm. a really full on place to fly, even on an immediate glider. Um, and yeah, so Xavier and I ended up teaming up for most of that week and moving and uh, the whole, the whole ex Andes thing was a bit of a shit show. Um, but Xavier was there because he basically he was another country that he hadn't flown in. I think he told me it was his 40-something country that he'd flown in, you know. And he was just there on a holiday. And then, uh, he unfortunately, he disappeared on us. We were all in the stern all together. And uh, I pulled out to go and take a couple of photos of Alpha Mail and some stuff that was right by. And he made another jump back to this next ridge. And Jeff and I were just not quite high enough. He was on a higher performing glider and then he disappeared. And then I just remember waking up, although we weren't staying at the same hotel that night. And I just remember waking up at like 5.30 in the morning with a really bad feeling about the whole thing because we were just hoping that he'd flown far and was coming back. And So I got up and I went around to his hotel to see if he'd come back and I bumped into Jeff Crystal on the way. Jeff was the same thing and, and Zab wasn't there. And then we had like a seven day search and rescue for him. And um, I ended up writing sort of daily briefs for cross country that we managed to raise 
a lot of money for Zav's rescue. Well, there were failed rescues, it turned out, but we yeah. didn't find them. Um, and I was really pleased that I actually went to the PWC meeting in Brazil this last year, and they still have that fund that we started that got, wow. came out of that. Huh. For, 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 you know. I didn't realize you were flying with him that day. I was the last one that saw him, yeah. Jeez. Yeah, and it was, I mean, he had been, he had been a little ill. He hadn't flown the day before, and, but there was nothing, I mean, there was nothing particularly s s different about that day or anything else. He just got really into the big mountains, and he actually crashed into Huascaran, and he was just loving it, hmm. you know. And you never did find him? We found him after seven days. Yeah, we ended up um, getting this, like, slow-moving uh, plane, you know, that they yep. use for aerial photography. Yeah. And then they found they went through the same zone like twice. But this was kind of a crazy story. So we're we're in Huraz trying to organize this rescue. And the PWC sent up a Canadian pilot who lived in Chile, who was a good friend of Zav's. And they sort of sent him up to help coordinate with the rescue. And there was a report that um, a kid had seen a glider. Mm. And we had a, it was kind of a reward being offered at this point. So we go down to the police station and we're talking to this kid, trying to figure out if there's any truth to the story. And this Canadian guy who's a PwC pilot, he's got his tablet with him. And he's watching the worlds in Piedrahita live time. Mm. And he's like, oh, one of my buddies has just crashed. Jesus. And then like a few minutes later, he's like, oh, no, another one of my buddies has just crashed. So like the two guys that crashed the first day, like one was Argentinian and mm -hmm. one was Chilean or something. And so here we are trying to deal with Xavier and all the carnage is going on in Piedrahita of the R11s and what have you at exactly the same time. And I remember that was just such a surreal experience. And mm. I told him just to go back to the hotel and do what he had to do. You know, It was just so weird. These two events were going on on opposite sides of the planet at yeah. exactly the same time. Right. Wow. Uh, and I mean, racing really changed that day all over the world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But Xavier was a, was a great influence and a great mm. guy. Yeah, he did. I was I always had it described to me as kind of the heart and soul of the whole thing. Well, it was his concept. Yeah, you know, and the real tragedy of that day and that whole event is he had a drawer full of spots back in France, and he went to Peru without a without a beacon. You know, yeah, which right. those, I mean, they had just come out, so there was still kind of new technology. It was all Jeff and I had them. Mm. Now they're like the most essential piece of equipment we yeah, have i think yeah, we can't go flying without those yeah yeah and that's one of the things like it's just amazing how it's the technology like i always say of all the sports i've been involved in paragliding is the one where where my imagination's never kept up with reality right because as as good as my imagination is paragliding just keeps going beyond it and we're so far beyond what i would have ever imagined in the 90s like if you had told me that oh one day you'd fly almost 250 miles I'd be like, yeah, right, a plane. Right. <laughs> you know, and the way the paragliders have continuously improved and our equipment and inreaches and all these things, you know, it's really opened it up. Mm. What has been the kind of the, the, the biggest driver of your kind of re-collision, I guess I'd call it, with, with paragliding? Because you're... You know, now, how many comps did you do in the last couple of years? You were you I did, been chasing uh, it hard. I did 14 and 13 months last year with a broken wrist in the middle of it. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad I did with this year being a ride off. Yeah, right. I mean, I did re-qualify for the PWC after like an 18-year gap or something. <laughs> um, my re-collision came, I was in Jackson Hole, and... Just, you know, once again, because I'm very grateful for Ozone because Ozone had kept me in flying all these years. And it wasn't just Rob Whittle. It was also Russ Ogden and Mike Kavanagh. I've known Mike for a long time. and They've always been very helpful at keeping me flying. I'm very grateful for that. And 
the intermediate gliders were getting really good. Like the Delta Two was was a re- was the first, the Delta Two was the first glider that I got on that I, I was like, oh, this is a real XC wing. You know, it really felt like mm. suddenly you were back on gliders that you could do things with. And so there was kind of an excitement with the shark nose. You know, yeah. it was really like this, you realize things were happening. And then I was in Jackson Hole and uh, with Nick Grease and John Hunt. And John was one of the original Jackson pilots and was my main flying partner for like a decade. Mm. You know, so we've always been good buddies. And so I rocked back into Jackson. And that was actually pretty funny. I uh, We got back the first day and it looked like a good day flying, but all the tandems were not going flying. So everyone assumed it was all blown out. And the, the boys were going dirt biking. So I'm like, oh, let's go dirt biking in, in Idaho. And we go over to Idaho and we're dirt biking. And we're up on top of this ridge. And, and I'm with Tom Bartlett and a couple of the tandem guys, you know. And I'm looking at the clouds and I'm like, man, it's really not moving that fast up there. And they're like, oh, no, we just didn't want to fly today. We just took off, right? So they just said it was blown out. The whole, the whole valley believed them, right? <laughs> so now it's like five in the afternoon. We've finished our dirt biking. And I'm like, oh, anybody want to go to Targi? And they're like, we've got our gliders with us. And I got my glider. Well, I'm going to go to Targi. So, and, 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 you know, in 97, I was the first person that flew across the Tetons from Targi back to Jackson. Wow. I was the first one that made the crossing after coming back from my, from Venezuela. I was all fired up. Yeah. All right. So now this is like you know, many years later, I'm on the Delta two and, uh, I go up there at like late afternoon and I launch and immediately go like 15 or 16,000 feet, fly back over the grand fly around the place and go and land. And I don't make it quite back to Jackson. I land out on the road to the park somewhere. The Subaru pulls over. It's John Patterson. Get <laughs> out of Hasn't seen me in like a decade, right? <laughs> like, what are you doing? The first guy you started flying with. Yeah, I'm like, oh, I just flew here from the Keys. Like, no way. <laughs> so, yeah. But I think the next day we're going up with Nick, who I just met. And we're going up to Phillips Canyon because I think the village was blown out. And, and you know, Nate had just done this big flight. Yeah. And somebody else had just done, there was like this. Beecher, one, farmer. A, farmer, right. Yeah, farmer this, had broken the record in 193 miles. Right. That, earlier that summer. And then Nate, a couple weeks later, went 199 miles. Right. So like, there was. Like a week before Nick and Hunt. Yeah, there was, this, there was this feeling that Seriously. 200 miles was going to drop in the Rockies at any yeah, moment. And it yeah. could be Utah, or it could be some value. And, we, and Jackson Hole is probably the least likely place for it to happen because it's really not that super well set up. The last few years, they've been having real weather, yeah, a lot weather, of wind. weather issues. Yeah, it hasn't worked. And Phillips Canyons is one of these funny little places where you're kind of under the wind. Un, you're in the lee side. You're under the wind, and it releases like once a day when the convergence, when it switches, there'll be this one really great thermal that will take you out of there. And if you just happen to be in the right spot and you catch this thermal, that's the right out. It's the same thermal that John Hunt caught on the Challenger Sea like 20 years earlier, right? Right. And so we're going up to launch and there was a guy that was in a mountain bike accident and there was this one guy who was hurt and we and you could tell that Nick and John just wanted to get to launch so bad. But we stopped and we helped these guys out. And we gave him a ride and we did something. And funny, I ran into one of the guys recently, and he remembered that he remembered that with it. He was like, "Oh, you helped us, huh. right?" And then we get up to launch, and John and Nick just launched straight into that convergence thermal, and they flew two hundred miles from yeah. there, yeah. you know. And John was on a nice big six, and Nick was on the first Enzo, yeah. And that was, and I was just like, "Oh, two liners, huh? These things look." You know, it was, it was a big jump. Suddenly it went from flying 100 miles was manly to, you know, 200, yeah, 200 was, miles was, was, now, was now the mark. And that yeah. was a pretty big jump. Yeah. And so when the two the two liners, was like, okay, I want to start finding out more about it. I want to get back into this level of flight. So that was kind of the inspiration. It was, was definitely that flight. It was a huge inspiration. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting because that series was the, the reason I moved to Sun Valley. That, that I was in Europe that summer when that happened. And when those flights went down, it just 
I think it blew a lot of people's minds. Yeah, it wasn't right. just me. It was just everybody in the world went, are you kidding me? What in the hell is this going down over there? And that was that article I wrote, the Rocky Mountain 200. Yeah, right. about the race. Yeah. yeah. Which is kind of when I started really getting And that there. was kind of Belcourt's concept, right? What Didn't he call it two, two, uh, 200 on a two-liner or two for two-liner or something? And that was his whole thing, that, that was like the push. You know, those guys were all chasing it. Like, you get 200 miles on a two-liner. Yeah, that was a fun a fun sequence for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and even at that point, if you told me that there would be 200 mile flights in my future, I don't know. I would have necessarily believed it. But so then I was like, all right. So that was sort of got me back to, into the racing back to Chelan. And when I, and when I was like, all right, I'm going to start racing again, you know, all my buddies from the old days were like, oh, get yourself an Enzo too. You know, I was like, ah, oh. I'm just going to take it a little bit easier. And um, I flew an M6 and an LM6. And then, you know, once again, right place, right time. I found out that Nick and Greece and Josh Cohn and John Hunt were all going to Brazil, to Kishida. Hmm. And I'd wanted to go. I've been hearing about Kishida for forever. Um, I was good friends with um, the Mexican pilot, Felipe Caram. And Felipe was, I think, the first one that told me about Kishida back in the day. And uh, I was like, oh, it's, it's, it sounds like a good boys trip. Can I come along, you know? So I kind of just jumped on the trip, but, but wait, like I jumped on you guys this week. And I get down there and I realize that, you know, Nick and Josh have got their race faces on and they're, 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 they're serious. serious. They want to break some records and stuff. And I think we're on like a boys trip, you know? <laughs> And they're all like 400K, 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 you know, and I'm like, that's way out of my league. And, but there was a town called Puri Puri, which sounded Maori, like from New Zealand. Yeah. Puri Puri could easily be a Maori name. And it was right at 200 miles, right at it. Yeah. Right. I was like, right, that's my goal. I'm going to fly 200 miles, right? And on the second flight in my LM6, I, I flew 198 and a half. I flew... I got two Puri Puri, and I mean, meanwhile, if I had just f- flowed away from Puri Puri right. down, yeah. then I would have even easily broken it, but I was determined, and I got two Puri Puri, and I realized to get 200, I was going to have to go over the town, and there was no LZs, and I was trying to get around it, and I went down at 198 and a half, <laughs> uh, 318 Ks or whatever, which I, to my astonishment was the New Zealand open distance record i don't mm. actually flown further than any new zealander huh. and the only reason i knew that was because matt senior held the record and he informed me that i had beaten his record from chelan um matt's a big part of the story because you know when i started to get back into racing we were down in uh Vale de bravo and it was the, the, the it was the moniker before the pre pre pwc and that first task, I did actually quite well. I made it into goal, and like like Luke Humboldt, a bunch of people didn't. It's kind of funny. And and Maddie was in there. And he was like, oh, you know, kind of because I met him in Shalam, but he hadn't really paid much attention. And then we were drinking beer. We got a ride back in an ambulance, and we're drinking beers in the back of the ambulance. And he's like, oh, you should try and fly for the New Zealand team. You know, I need a teammate. Because he had represented New Zealand in like the last three, yeah. And I had in all my years, I'd never thought about trying to represent for New Zealand. It never even occurred to me. And then when Maddie put the idea in my head, I was like, "Oh, that sounds interesting." And so that kind of set me on the path to be a bit more serious about my race and give me a goal, and uh, put me in contact with New Zealand flying for better or for worse. And then uh, culminated in the series that I did for for um, cross country with Steve Hamden and the illustrations. Great series. Which is really one of my most favorite things that I've ever done. Yeah, that was a great series. Those of you listening, uh, Kiwi did a, a four-part series, right? Uh, I think it was, I mean, it was supposed to be, I broke my wrist before the series came to its end, right. unfortunately. But I think there's like five of them. There's five, published, yeah. Right? And it was they're all long-form stories about you making the world's team or, Try, trying, trying to, to make the world's team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The road it all mess. fizzles at the end. The road's a mess, though. I, managed, I mean, I have more mishaps than than, than uh, anything else. 
But, you know, I've known Steve Ham since since the late 90s and going to Petra Heater too. So it was really a thrill to work with him Yeah. after all these years. And uh, it was a really fun fun thing. I mean, it's a good it's good to give yourself goals in flying. I don't I think it's good not taking necessarily too seriously, but it's nice to have goals just keep advancing you along. And um, I think I'm 200 and f- 203 in the world on my WPRS rankings at the moment, which yeah. I, I really think I'm flying better at 53 than I ever have. So it's kind of cool to feel like you can just keep progressing and get better. You've heard this question over and over again, but I still love it. So I ask it when you look back, you started in the mid eighties. You've had decades now at this game. 30 years. What would you change? Whew, what would I change? I, I wish I'd been a better learner early on. I, I think I'm a bit of a learning disability. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I was just, I'm still flying more due to good luck than good management. Mm. And I've watched a lot of great pilots not be as lucky. Yeah. So I feel really fortunate about that. I don't think there's anything I would really change. It's been, it's been, it's been a a great adventure and it keeps getting better. Mm. You know, I mean, I didn't expect to be sitting here in in Hebronville towing up with you guys and here we are. So who, who knows where the adventure will go this week. Right. So Kiwi, using the word you used when we started this thing all off, the collision you've had with flying kind of your whole life, how would you describe the collision between, you know, the psychedelic noir, the, the, the life that you've lived in that realm and also with flying? How do those two, how do you see those two lining up? My two, my two worlds. Uh, I mean, I would hope it's more of a dance than a collision these days. I think there's lots of uh, lots of crossover, but essentially the way they're the similar or the same is is really that like tribes, they're wandering tribes, um, and the psychedelic uh, conferences and festivals that I get to go and speak at always have a really high concentration of interesting people. You know, I think some of them. Burning Man has the reputation of having the highest concentration of the most interesting people you'll ever meet in your life. And that's generally pretty pretty right from my experience. Um, and same with the conferences. And I'm finding, you know, I have the same experience in paragliding. It's just a different tribe. It's different family. And I mean, last year, uh, you know, I flew in 13 or 14 comps and 10 countries and I made so many new friends. I made a ton of friends in the, the English pilots uh, you know, fly in the last couple of years and it's, you're moving around, seeing your friends and both of these kind of things. And, and they're both really interesting groups of people. It was funny at the, uh, PwC and Andradas in Brazil, I kept, you know, asking people about what they had done or what they did outside of flying. And I was kept getting the same kind of answer, which is they've generally all had really interesting careers and often been very good at what they'd done and something else. And then they always went along the lines of, and then I discovered paragliding <laughs> and their whole lives kind of dropped off. So I think I've maybe done a better job of um, merging the two. And I mean, I've had moments like, for example, at Burning Man, I ran this giant uh, riverboat art car for years, the Lady Sassafras. And there'd be times I'd look down and there'd be a bunch of top American pilots that I know in a very different setting you know, now enjoying that at Burning Man. So that was always fun mm. and a thrill. Um, but yeah, I think it's really the, the, the high quality of the people I meet in both endeavors that gives me that, gives it an extra element, you know, what makes a part of my life, why won't I keep it, part, I keep it a part of my life. And then they're both, uh, you know, examinations of differentiated states of consciousness. So when when we're flying, I think your consciousness is an adapt is in a total different mode. That's not an evolutionary adaption because we've just forced it upon it. I mean, going into a clouds totally is as unnatural as eating a magic mushroom. And so there are these different whether it's meditation or yoga or different things, you know, experiencing differentiated states of consciousness ultimately makes you a more whole and complete person. I think. What kind of people do you think are attracted to this sport? And 
and draw the line, the comparison with what kind of people are attracted to the festivals, the psychedelics, the that world? Well, the festival world, you know, festivals are, are very much a 21st century phenomena. Um, 20 years ago, there was something like a dozen major festivals in the United States. And now there's 900 or something. And a similar thing's gone on in, in Europe where festivals have become a major way, a major social platform and a sort of major cultural event, really. It's not particularly well understood. Um, and I think, once again, I think most people are being drawn towards this idea of connection and some kind of a tribe. And the more festivals you go to, the more you keep running into the same people. So you build up this kind of like traveling family, you know. And, uh, you know, I think, I think the, the community aspect of paragliding is very high. Like even at the most top level competitions, people are still friendly and, and, enjoy each other's company and there's you know if, a, if another pilot might happen to crash get hurt then we're all involved in that in some way or another so it's a very um communal sport i think and and both are communal in that aspect do you think there's like a i've often you know we often compare life to the ups and downs of flying you know you're you're on the moon. When you're on the moon, it just couldn't be better. When you're scrapping low, it just it couldn't be worse. And it, do you, do you think there's a, a compare? You know, I've heard stories of, you know, the the emotional high that is sustained through, say, a Burning Man for a week. The coming down off of that can can really be hard for people, uh, in a way that I think flying can for people certainly it, it has been for me with like something like the x alps but do you think there's a manicness to the people that are attracted to this sport do you think there's that many of us are on a spectrum or a deal with well it's interesting because you live in sun valley and you know, i spend a lot of time in jackson hole uh wyoming which are for uh, uh two of the more extreme kind of places in america where people are attracted to all these various sports and we've both been astounded of how paragliding has never really caught on, even amongst a population that you would think would be more inclined towards trying it. Um, so it makes you one, you think, I mean, you were saying the other day, you got friends you ski and bike with, they think, oh yeah, that's great, but have zero interest. Right. And it make, I do think that there's a certain mentality that's drawn towards paragliding, um, especially like cross-country flying and competition flying. You never stop learning. And there are very few things in life that you can continue to learn and learn and learn and be really jazzed to continue to learn and learn and learn. You know, maybe music's another one, the playing of an instrument where you never get tired of that process of getting better and discovering new things and there's no ceiling, you know. So I think maybe there's people like that are really attracted to it. You see a lot of engineers, you see a lot of software people, especially in the traveling circus of that we are a part of, you know. Um, so there's a certain the engineering, the engineering mentality towards paragliding always amuses me. Like the guys who are like, no, paragliding is not an extreme sport. How can you say that? It's not dangerous to you know. Mm. It's a controlled risk danger to them compared compared to it's all an equation. Control, you know, controlled risk, yeah. and uh, I, that obviously those are the kind of people that are attracted to it. Mm. When you look back at your 35 something years of flying, would you change anything? Would you do anything differently? I mean, I think the thing looking back that, you know, we would all love to change would be the accidents and the friends we've lost. You know, um, I've lost some really good friends, Chris Mueller and different people that I really wish were still around. Um, my own personal journey has been uh, blessed you know, rather fortunate. I wish I'd been a bit of better learner in the early days. And, you know, I took a pretty substantial break before coming back to competition. And there are some days when I'm like, well, if I just kept at it, I could be half as good as Josh Cohn or, <laughs> or Russ by now, or a quarter as good. Um, but at the same time, I don't regret the decisions I made to go out and do the other things I did and come back to paragliding. 
that's been a special journey as well. So I don't, the only the only regrets I have is the high level of incidents that we still continue to have. Mm. And I've given that a lot of thought the last few months since um, the pre PWC in Chile when unfortunately we had a fatality. And, you know, the equipment gets better. So we just fly it in more and more extreme conditions. We just fly in more wind now and everything else. And so you have that fact that the equipment is still better. But the one thing you really can just can't take out of the, the equation is the human element and the human being's decision making process. So I don't, and it's funny, I don't think that's something we'll ever get rid of in paragliding. It's just, it's part of the matrix of what we do. Um, for me, the ideal is definitely fly a long time. You know, I've seen a lot of really good young pilots come and go really quick. I see people come in and burn out, I see people come in and get hurt. For me, you know, someone like Pepe, Andreas Maliki, or, or these guys are, the, are kind of my ideal of, of just flying at a really high level for as many years as you can, because there are very few sports. This may be the only sport, maybe sailing, that guys in their 50s and even to their 60s can be world class at what they do. So that makes it very special as well. Mm. Your latest book is Under the Influence, 20 Tales of Psychedelic Noir, which I'm really enjoying. I encourage all of you to go out and get it. It's a blast. Uh, where can people find out more about you? Yeah, if people are interested in re uh, checking out my books, they should look at my website, which is James O Rock, O R O C dot com which is my writer's name, and they'll see links to my books and photography and what have you on there. Kiwi, thanks, man. I hope we get some good flying while we're down here, and uh, it's been good to spend some time with you, and thanks for your insights. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. If you find the cloud-based mayhem valuable, you can support it in a lot of different ways. You can give us a rating on iTunes or Stitcher or however you get your podcast. That goes a long ways and helps spread the word. You can blog about it on your own website or share it on social media. You can talk about it on the way up to launch with your pilot friends. I know a lot of interesting conversations have happened that way. And, of course, you can support us financially. This show does take a lot of time, a lot of editing, a lot of storage and music and all kinds of behind-the-scenes costs. So if you can support us financially, all we've ever asked for is a buck a show. And you can do that through a one-time donation through PayPal, or you can set up a subscription service that charges you for each show that comes out. We put a new show out every two weeks. So, for example, if you did a buck a show and every two weeks, it'd be about $25 a year. So way cheaper than a magazine subscription, and it makes all of this possible. Uh, I do not want to fund this show with advertising or sponsors. We get asked about that uh, pretty frequently, but I... For a whole bunch of different reasons, which I've said many times on the show, I don't want to do that. I don't like having that stuff at the front of the show. And I also want you to know that these are authentic conversations with real people. And these are just our opinions, but our opinions are not being skewed by sponsors or advertising dollars. I think that's a pretty toxic business model. So I hope you dig that. Um, you can support us. If you go to cloudbasedmayhem.com, you can find the places to support. You can do it through patreon.com forward slash cloudbasedmayhem. If you want a recurring subscription, you can also do that directly through the website. Uh, we've tried to make it really easy, and that will give you access to all the bonus material, a little video cast that we do and extra little uh, nuggets that we find in conversations that don't make it into the main show, but we feel like you should hear. We don't put any of that behind a paywall. If you can't afford to support us then just let me know and i'll set you up with an account of course that'll be lifetime and hopefully and you're being in a position someday to be able to support us but you'll find all that on the website uh, all of you who have supported us or even joined our newsletter or bought cloud-based mayhem merchandise t-shirts or hats or anything you should be all set up you should have an account and you should be able to access all that bonus material now thank you so much for listening i really appreciate your support and we'll see you on the next show Thank you.